the anonymous author of The Cloud of Unknowing, written in the 14th century in England, takes a similar approach. Similar in that he too refers first to an awakening and then provides a method or a form of active contemplation to cultivate fidelity to the grace that has been awakened. In speaking of the awakening, the author of the cloud says that there are those presently engaged in the act of life who are being prepared by God to grasp the message of this book. I am speaking of those who from time to time feel the stirrings of love in the very ground of their being. It begins with a blind stirring of love in the very core of your being. It takes you by surprise. And then in response to the blind stirring of love, the author of the cloud offers a practice. The practice is to sit quietly and interiorly turn to the place within the heart in which the stirring awakened us. The image I have of this is to imagine yourself being out in the mountains at night in pitch darkness, and there's a sudden flash of light off in the distance. If you were to tell someone about the flash of light, you could point in the direction you saw it. So we can interiorly turn in the direction from which the blind stirring of love rose up from within us. It's an interior stance of attentiveness to a mysterious place within the depths of ourself. He then says, allow an intention of naked love to rise from this place, seeking God as he is in himself, not seeking God as he is in us, namely as we know him in our thoughts and beliefs and all the rest of it, but rather to know God as God knows God, to love God as God loves God. And he says that it might be helpful in sustaining this intention of union to repeat a word or phrase within yourself each time you notice you drift off into this or that thought, daydreaming, sleepiness, and the like. So that in the way of the pilgrim and in the cloud of unknowing, we have two classical sources in which we can see both this mystical passive dimension of contemplative prayer and this active acquired dimension of a practice or a method that cultivates our fidelity to it. As distinct from this, Meister Eckhart is much more intent upon an overall generalized metamorphosis of the foundations of our consciousness. Eckhart speaks, for example, of becoming a virgin, by which he says he means to be detached from all images as when one was not yet. That is, to be virginal, meaning not to be attached to any ideas about God, any ideas about oneself, any ideas about the earth, and to live in a state of non-attachment with respect to all images. But Eckhart tends not to go specifically into the details of prayer itself, much less does he go into the details of any kind of method. St. John of the Cross is similar and that in St. John of the Cross, there is no method of meditation or contemplative prayer, strictly speaking. For St. John of the Cross, spiritual reading and discursive meditation are the normative ways of prayer that are consistent with our nature. God creates us as thinking beings who express our faith and our prayer through our thoughts and reflections and so forth. He says, however, at a certain point, one may discover within oneself three signs by which one can recognize the call to contemplation. The first sign being that one is no longer nurtured by reflecting on the things of God. 
Secondly, that one is no longer nurtured by thinking of anything else either. He says, however, the first two signs alone are not enough because maybe you're not inclined to think of the things of God because of things that are going on in your life. Likewise, he says, the fact that you're not inclined to think of anything in particular may be due to the fact that you have a humor in your bile or in your brain. In other words, in our language today, maybe you're depressed. Maybe you need a back rub and a cold shower and a walk around the block and a cup of tea. He says, therefore, the surest sign is that one likes to remain alone in a general loving awareness of God without regard for anything in particular. He says, this awareness can be most disconcerting to the ego that feels it's doing nothing, achieving nothing, acquiring nothing. But he encourages the person with prudence and with guidance to remain faithful to this loving union as opening up within oneself this path of self-transformation. When Thomas Merton speaks of prayer and meditation, he does so in a manner much more consistent with St. John of the Cross and with Meister Eckhart. That is, there is no Merton technique for meditation practice. Rather, Merton tends to focus on some fundamental aspects of the essence of contemplative prayer and offers insight and guidance as to how to be faithful to the transforming effects of prayer and meditation. What makes Merton so particularly helpful in this regard is that he's a person of our own age. He's a person who looked out at the world that we look out upon, who was concerned about the things that we're concerned about. And therefore, in being awakened in this culture, he uses the language and the images and the thought patterns of this culture. And we recognize in his teachings a certain affinity that helps us get more directly at what it is that he's trying to share with us. This concludes CD3 of Thomas Merton's Path to the Palace of Nowhere with James Finley. We continue with CD4. Thank you.